We're in our series this summer called Snapshots from a Spiritual Journey. And uh, we're just taking little snapshots here and there. They're selfies. The, uh, you know, Moses is just taking like, little shots of his own life here as he's writing the book of Exodus. And uh, so it's not like a movie. We skip around. Uh, we'll hit some verses, a lot of them pretty thoroughly, and others we'll just kind of skip because they're just snapshots. Today we're looking at something, or <clears throat> sometimes things get worse before they get better. You know what I mean? Imagine going to the dentist for the first time. You got a cavity. You're sitting in the chair, you think nothing of it, you look over at these little tiny dainty tools. <laughs> Aren't those cute? <laughs> and uh, then he says, uh, okay, listen, you got a cavity, I'm gonna have to fill it. And so uh, uh, he says, uh, first thing I wanna do is uh, numb you. And he pulls out, you know what it is, the big long needle. <laughs> and uh, you say, whoa, wait a minute. That looks like that's gonna hurt, I'll pass. Oh, he said, what, you gonna pass? Yeah, I'll pass, I don't want you're not sticking that thing in my mouth. He says, okay. He says, now, this is going to hurt. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. <laughs> and so he uh, goes in, he starts to drill. And you go, whoa, stop, whoo, time out. He said, well, hey, I got to get the cavity out. And you say, well, no, no, hey, just put the new stuff in. Don't take the old out. Just, just put the new stuff in. You know what he's going to say? No. I don't operate like that. <laughs> I don't. I don't operate like that. Sometimes, some circumstances, things got to get worse before they get better. I just asked my wife who fell down the stairs and uh, broke her, her wrist. Uh, believe me, she was doing fine in the hospital until the medication wore off. <laughs> All right? It, it, but it had to get worse. After that, for weeks, it would hurt just to move her hand. It's, it's, got, it's worse before it gets better. Life is like that. In fact, we're going to see this as a reoccurring theme in the book of Exodus. Sometimes things got to get worse before they get better. Actually, I want to do a quick review. Uh, you remember that last time we talked that God had called Moses on a burning bush, and the bush was burning. Moses stopped, set it, went aside, saw it was burning because this is unusual. It's not being consumed. And God spoke to him out of it and said, I'm sending you. I'm going to send you to, to deliver my people. And uh, you remember what Moses did? Yeah. Five times, he said, uh, 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 no, <laughs> you got to be kidding. The last one was, I just don't want to do it, all right? And uh, we wound up there saying, well, you know, uh, <clears throat> God pretty much said to Moses, you won't like me when I'm angry, and, uh, because God got angry, and finally he said, okay, here comes your brother Aaron, the two of you can do this together. And so finally Moses made a decision that he would do better. You ever done that? Made a decision to do better, an exercise, what you eat, okay. He, he's made the decision that he's going to do better. We all make those kinds of decisions. But as he made the decision to do better, <clears throat> I want to notice that it was a pessimistic decision. You know, that is a, the decision that sees life as uh, half empty, all right. Moses uh, went back to his father-in-law Jethro and said to him, please let me go back to my, my kindred in Egypt and see if, whether they're living, they're still living. Uh, he, he's very pessimistic. They're, they're probably not even there at all, okay? And not that, hey, God has given me this wonderful assignment, and I'm going to go and rescue God's people, but uh, he's very pessimistic about it. This is a person who looks at life uh, on the negative side. The next thing I notice is Jethro says to Moses, I call Moses his 80-year-old millennial son-in-law. He's been living with Jethro for 40 years. <laughs> Come on. And he says to him, hey, go in peace. I see why he wants to get rid of him, all right? Hey, you've been, you've been living with me for 40 years? Come on, it's time for you to get out on your own. And so he's got an optimistic decision here. Yeah, go, do it. And the next thing I notice in the passage is that there's even another way of looking at this, and it's called an opportunistic decision. The Lord said to Moses and Midian, go back to Egypt for all those who were seeking your life are dead. You see, he fled because uh, Pharaoh was trying to kill him for having tried to initially liberate the Israelite community and killing that Egyptian person. And so he fled. He's saying, listen, circumstances have changed. The opportunity is right. Now is the time. You know, Moses, you were running ahead of me 40 years ago. Now is the time. Don't lag behind me. And so now is the opportunity for you to decide to go. 
It was a resolved decision. So Moses took his wife and his sons, and he put them on a donkey, and he went back to the land of Egypt. He didn't say, hey, I'll be back in a few weeks. I'm going to go explore this, check this out. He takes his wife, and he also takes his sons, and they're on their way. He is resolved in this decision. I am going to go and do this. Sometimes, even if we don't feel like it, we've got to be resolved to do what we don't want to do simply because it's the right thing to do. So Moses has made this resolution, but I also noticed that it's a faith resolution. Not only pack up his family and kids, <clears throat> but he also took his staff, the staff of God in his hand. You say, how is this an act of faith? Well, back in verse 17 that I kind of skipped, it said this, Moses, when you go, take, your, take in your hand this staff, which you shall perform signs. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> God has <clears throat> not given me a staff, but he has given me, I got it right here, a Bible. <laughs> and with this Bible, God says he's going to do awesome, wonderful, powerful things. He's going to, uh, inside this is the gospel. <clears throat> the gospel, it says, is the power of God unto salvation. Moses doesn't even have a Bible. You realize he hasn't even written Genesis yet? He's got nothing. And so he's got a staff in his hand, and God promised to do great things with that staff. So he took that staff in his hand, and he took it in hand because he knew God was going to do great things. He believes, he trusts in God. <clears throat> well, he made the decision to do better. Now he is going to actually make some preparation to do better. You see, you've got to prepare. It's powerful pre preparation. He says, and the Lord said unto Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have put in your power. And he says, hey, you better practice with that staff. I'd like to have been there in the wilderness. I don't know what he did with that staff. <laughs> but Moses knows that when God tells him to use the staff, powerful things happen. It's kind of like I need to practice with the word. I need to get into word. I, I need to have some practice here so that I know these verses. And when an opportunity comes up, I know how to use those verses. You know, I, I, I've spent some time in it, and, and that verse pops into my mind, and it comes out of my mouth, and I demonstrate the power of God. It's powerful preparation. He had been making this preparation. He says, but even though I've given you this powerful preparation, he said, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. He's going to have a stone heart. He's, he's preparing Moses. Now, Moses, sometimes you've got to think, this guy's a little thick. He's telling him now. And then later when Pharaoh won't listen to him, it's like he had totally forgot that God said he is not going to let your people go. Powerful preparation. We've got to make that preparation. Now, it's consequential preparation that he's making. It's a matter of life and death. Watch what he says. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord. He's not even gone back to Pharaoh. He's not met the new Pharaoh. He says, Israel is my firstborn son. Israel's my firstborn. And I said to you, let my son go that he may worship. But you refuse to let him go. And so now I will kill your first son. Whoa. Pharaoh was living a condemned life and didn't know it. That's the way we were too. John 3, 16, we know that. Verse 17 says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already. Pharaoh was living in a condemned situation. Everybody we know is living in a condemned situation. We're born into a condemned situation. That's why I got to know how to use this book because this book is the power of God unto salvation so that when I share with people about Jesus, they can come to be saved and they don't have to be condemned. The day was coming. God is already telling Moses that Pharaoh is going to reject and in that rejection, he will lose his own son. There are consequences in our preparation that we're making. 
The next thing I noticed in the text is it really, I almost thought about skipping over this, but anybody say, well, why did you skip over that? Because it's really a difficult, difficult part to understand. It's individual preparation. On the way, he's on his way now. He's left his father-in-law. He's on his way to Egypt. At the place, he stops at a motel for the night. I don't know which one it was. But he checks in, and, that, and, and it says, the Lord met him. Isn't that great? It's the next verse. The next part of his verse. And tried to kill him. God tried to kill Moses. Oh my goodness, what's going on here? But Zipporah, that's Moses' wife, took a flint knife and cut off her son's foreskins. She circumcised their sons and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Truly, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. What's going on here? Moses had neglected the very basic of covenant relationship with God. He neglected to circumcise his own children. And what we have here is, if you're going to be prepared to do things for the Lord, then you've got to be individually prepared. You've got to make sure you've taken care of business in your own heart before you try to take care of business someone else. It's like riding in the airline. It says, hey, when that oxygen mask drops, first put it on yourself, and then put it on who's ever with you. Moses, take heed to yourself before you try to take heed to someone else. There's individual preparation that needed to be made, and he made it. And then I jump down a few verses here, and I, I find in the text that there was group preparation. When he arrived in Egypt, he went to the Jewish community, and it says, they assembled the elders of all the Jews there, of the Israelites. And Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses. Remember, Moses didn't want to speak, so he told Aaron everything Aaron tells the people. And it says, and he did all these, he performed these signs in the sight of the people. I find it very interesting in the book of Exodus. What God does in these miraculous, powerful things that Moses is doing with his staff, to the Jews, they're, they're always called signs. But when they're being done, and the Egyptians are on the brunt of them, they're always called plagues. You see, what the Lord does, if you know the Lord, is a sign. But if you don't know the Lord, it's a plague. And, and so what he's got here, he's, he's preparing the people. Notice what it says there in verse 31. And the people believed. Moses was so afraid. We saw the last time. Nobody's going to believe me. Remember? Remember? What if they don't believe me? I don't know your name. And he's got all these excuses. Why not? But the people believed. You and I, we're afraid sometimes to speak up the name of Jesus because we're afraid, what are they going to think of me? What, what, they won't believe me. And we don't. Moses goes to his people. He speaks up, and they believe. Text goes on and said, and they worship the Lord. All right, so he's made a decision. He's got his preparation. At some point, the Nike expression is, you just got to do it. Just do it. Just do it. You got to do it. So here it is. Come to chapter 5. They did it. They went and they spoke up, Moses and Aaron, and they said, thus says the Lord. Now, notice it is the tetragrammaton. It's the four letters. It's Yahweh. Moses didn't even know this. He goes in, he goes up, up to Pharaoh, and he says, hey, Yahweh. Now, like, Pharaoh's ever heard of Yahweh, Okay. He's never heard of him. He says, thus says Yahweh, let my people go so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. He did it. He just went out and did it. He spoke up, right? It's at that point that Pharaoh says, uh, who is the Lord? Who is Yahweh? You know, Moses said, uh, I don't even know your name, uh, Last time we saw, I don't even know your name. Now he knows the name, and now that you know it, Moses, Pharaoh doesn't know. Who is the Lord that I should heed him and let, my, and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. That was a mistake to say that. He is about to know the Lord. The Lord is going to crash into Pharaoh's existence. If there's anybody on planet Earth who didn't know the Lord, that comes to know the Lord, not in a salvation way, but he's going to know who the Lord is, it is Pharaoh. And he said, I do not know the Lord. I will not let Israel go. Well, it's at that point, not only did have they spoken up, but now they stood up to Pharaoh. And they said, the God of the Hebrews has, rewarded him, uh, has revealed himself to us. 
Let us go a three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God or he will fall upon us. Why do you think he said that? Well, you know what happened at that motel on the way to Egypt. God was about to kill him. He said, listen, we got to do this. I serve a holy God. I serve a God when he says you do it, you better do it. Or else I serve the true and living God. He said, he'll fall upon us with pestilence or a sword. Well, they spoke up. They stood up. They're attempting to do better. Now, the title of my message is this. Sometimes things get worse before they get better. Moses is fully expecting Pharaoh is going to cower back down and say, go three days journey. Have a nice three-day weekend, vacation. Hey, where you, you're not going up north? Oh, no, you're going south to Sinai? Hope the weather's fine while you're there. Moses got this expectation. Why he would have that, I don't know. He's already, God's already said, his heart's going to be hard. But Moses has that, and it gets worse. This is what happens. Things don't always go as Moses has planned. Things don't always go as you've planned either, and you probably know that by now. A bad situation arises because it says this. Instead of being so accommodating, Pharaoh becomes demanding. But the king of Egypt says to them, get to your labor. Get back to work. That same day, Pharaoh commands the taskmasters, you shall no longer give the people straw to make the brick. You see, what happens is bad situations getting worse because now you've got to do the same job without the resources to do the job. I don't know if you've ever had a job where you didn't have the resources to do the job, but it really makes a job very difficult. <laughs> it does. I one time took a job. I took a job with the public defender's office, downtown Detroit, uh, a job that I knew I didn't have the skills to do. I figured I'd just learn them. I was so far over my head, I was dying every day. As I'd, every day I'd work all day, then I'd go home and study all night to figure out how I'm supposed to do what, do what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> it's terrible. So he says here, a bad situation because it's got a lack of resources. You shall no longer give the people the straw and let them go gather the straw for themselves. We're not providing, you've got to do it yourself. It becomes an unrealistic expectation situation. Because he goes on and says this, you are require, you're going to require of them the same quantity of bricks. You jump down further in the passage, it says, you shall not lessen your daily number of bricks. You've got to pro produce the same amount, but we're not giving you the resources to do it. And when they didn't do it, if you read the text, they beat them for not having met the quota. Bad situation just really got worse. Then there's the false accusations. Sometimes these are the hardest. You're out there trying to do the best you can. You're picking up every little bit of straw and you're bringing it together with the mud. You're making your bricks and you're not quite making the quota. And they say, you're lazy. Your boss attributes to you evil or wrong motives. You're lazy, lazy. That's why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. You're lazy, false accusations. Now, this is a bad situation, but I'm going to tell you what, I think it even gets worse. The bad situation gets worse, and here's how. Moses' own people let him down. His own family, his friends, the people he's trying to minister to and deliver. As they left Pharaoh, the, you know, the, all these stewards that were over the Jews, uh, from the, among the Israelites, they came upon Moses and Aaron who were waiting to meet them. And this is what they said. The Lord look upon you and judge you. I hope the Lord really gives it to you for the fine mess you got us in, Moses. You, you've really made us a sorry lot here. You have brought, brought us into a bad odor with Pharaoh. We stink in front of Pharaoh. He, we're a stench. He, he, next part. And his officials, okay, Pharaoh, they, they just think that they hate the Jews now. He says, and you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. His own people now are attacking him. It's really, really gone from bad to worse. And then there's this. 
Moses is at the point in his life at this moment where he feels God let him down. God has let him down. Ever been there? God has let, let you down? Here you've had all these great expectations and, and you've been reading your Bible, you've been praying, you've been doing your daily devotion, you've been trying to share your faith and, and you're praying for something specific and, and it doesn't happen the way you've been telling God he should run his universe. <laughs> oh Lord, why have you mistreated this people? Why did you ever send me? Why? Why God? Like God has got to give us a reason for what he does? Wait a minute. Who's God here? Me, Moses, or Yahweh? Yahweh is God. And Moses is trying to make God accountable to him. He's complaining. He's feeling sorry for himself. The situation has got much worse. He says then, since I first came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has mistreated this people, and you have done nothing at all to deliver your people. God, you're not good on your promises. You ever been that low? I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one here. <laughs> Where things were going so wrong that you say, what's the use? Why serve you, God? You're not doing anything. You don't seem to care. What's the deal here? You see, sometimes things get worse before they get better. You have not done anything. Oh, where are you, Lord? So why does it sometimes get worse before it gets better? That's the question. And this whole message has been building to this point, and I know that's why you've been listening. You want to know, well, why does it? Why does it? And I want to give you the correct answer. The correct answer is found in the very next chapter, chapter 6, verse 1. You will see what I will do. You are about to see what I will do. The Lord then said, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Indeed, by a mighty hand he will let them go. Listen, by a mighty hand he will drive them out. Listen, Moses, you're not going to be the one doing it. I am the one that's doing it. And I'm going to do it through a hard-hearted man. He's going to drive you out so that he, if you read the next verse, so that he knows who the Lord is. See, the world really doesn't revolve around me. I like to think so. I like to think the world revolves around me. You like to think the world revolves around you. The world revolves around him. Around him. You will see what I will do. God is saying, I'm, I'm not done with this set of circumstances yet. I always like hindsight better than foresight because when I look ahead, I say, oh my goodness, how's God going to do? And then when I look back, look how God operated. Look what God did. God was so awesome at all of that. Listen, I call this the 50-20 principle. It's found in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Now, Moses hasn't written it yet, so he doesn't even know this verse. But one day he's going to write this verse, okay? And, and Moses is living it before he learns that Joseph had lived it before him, and he writes it down so we can all have this principle. In this principle, Joseph has been betrayed by his brothers, his own family. Uh, he's been a, a, a slave. He's, he's been in jail, and, and, and now God's turned all the circumstances around, and, and he's risen to power, and his brothers come to see him, and they all bow down to him and, uh, because they're in great need. And uh, when they find out that it is actually Joseph, their brother, that is second to the king in, in Egypt. And what they've done to him, they, they think that Joseph is going to get even with him, or with them. And Joseph says this to his brothers, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. That's powerful. You and I both have people in our lives, I call them enemies. They make it their number one, preoccupation and priority to make life miserable for you. <laughs> That's an enemy. At work, in the neighborhood, wherever. You, 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 we don't even have to try to find enemies. They're just there. Moses had an enemy in Pharaoh. And even though Pharaoh is intending to harm, God intends it for good. I don't know what your circumstances are. I don't know who's giving you difficulty in your life. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a boss. I don't know who it is. 
And they intend to harm you. And God says, I'm just intending to do good out of that. You watch and see. You watch and see. Now, in the New Testament, we got the same principle. It's called the Romans 828 principle, the 828 principle. And it goes like this. We know that all things, not just all people and their intentions, but all things, every circumstance, works together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You know, there's two systems of theology. One's Arminianism that starts with man. There's Calvinism, which starts with God. Arminianism, in that system of theology, uh, it, you know, God loves me as long as I do everything good. If I mess up, then God doesn't love me anymore, and I've got to get back in favor with God. Calvinist says God loves me no matter what. Even when I mess up, he still loves me because he's chosen me from the foundation of the world. So you got the two. The two guys are walking down, uh, walk, walk on towards a flight of stairs. The Arminian falls down the stairs, and he, Gets up and says, oh, God, what did I do wrong? You must hate me. I want, you, I want to get back into your favor and your love. The Calvinist comes along. He falls down the same stairs. Gets up, brushes himself off, says, praise the Lord, that's over with. <laughs> God, what are you going to do next? You see, I tend to be in that camp because that's where the Bible's at. I don't care what happens in my life. God works everything together for good. Now, because that is so, there's this Peter principle. I didn't write that up there, but it's, it's Peter has this one. Because that is so, all things work together for good, and what they intend to harm me, God turns to good. Because that's so, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals that is taking place among you to test you. That was what happening to Moses. He was in a fiery ordeal that was testing him. He says, "Don't, don't, don't be surprised." as though something strange were happening. No, this is normal stuff. If somebody told you the day you accept Christ as your Savior, everything in life is going to be wonderful and pie in the sky, they lied to you. <laughs> Don't think it's strange when you've got hard times. But rejoice. Why? Insofar as you're sharing the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also be glad and shout with joy when His glory is revealed that is coming and in you. God has a purpose for everything that's going on. Wow. Sometimes things get worse before they get better because God has something greater to accomplish than what you think in your little finite mind and what I think in my little finite mind. He has something bigger, grander to do than what I think of. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us keep focus on the eternal and not on the temporary, on the infinite, not on the finite, on the creator and not the creature. Help us to every day remind ourselves it's not about me, it's all about you, Lord. And accept from your hand your wise providence and what you're doing. And make sure that we obey you, follow your precepts and your commands. Bless, O oh Lord. Someone here today might be struggling with a hard time, physically, financially, relationship-wise. Uh, Lord, I don't know what it could be at work or at school. Uh, Lord, I don't know, but you do know. And whatever that is, give them the encouragement that they need, that you are not finished with the situation yet. Have them have hope. Generate that in their heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.